so now let's start this uh, let's start this uh, new topic which is of uh, using multiple junction that is using more than uh, one pn junction so using maybe two pn junction or three pn junction and uh, and forming a solar cell uh, using that so this is a field which is uh, seeing a lot of progress uh, recently and uh, uh, I've taken this chart which shows the efficiencies of these multi-junction silicon, uh, multi-junction solar cell as they have been uh, uh, reported in the literature and then subsequently verified by uh, NREL in many cases. So you can see that, uh, you know, as if you look at the efficiency chart for, let's say, crystalline silicon or you will look at it uh, for, uh, let's say, even single junction gallium arsenide, you'll see that these things have saturated. Versus over here, you still see a lot of uh, progress happening. Uh, every year, uh, you see that you know somebody will announce a new efficiency record for uh, multi-junction solar cell. So let me ask you know, a trivia question. Does anybody know what is the maximum efficiency so far which people have realized with a multi-junction solar cell? 49. How many people think more than that? Less than that? How much? 46. You sure? Oh, okay. He has the exact number. <laughs> so the maximum so far is is around 43.5. It's uh, held by uh, this company, Solar Junction. So who will be our guest speaker. Vijit, who is one of the founders of that company, will be our guest speaker uh, uh, on Wednesday. But they have a, they are another company which usually competes with them for these efficiencies, uh, a company called Spectrolab. It's a Boeing-owned company which makes these multi-junction solar cells uh, for, uh, you know, for space kind of applications. And usually they keep competing with each other. So far, I think the records in the last two years have been held by uh, solar junction, but it's it's 43 percent, as you could see from this curve. Well. <coughs> and this is realized at a concentration of uh, thousand x, and I'll talk why concentration is important. Okay. So. So now when most of the people think about uh, multi-junction cells, they think of uh, you know, one material which is lower band gap, and then you grow another cell on top which is uh, in between uh, band gap, and then on top of it maybe grow another material which is uh, the highest band gap. Right? How many people perceive that is the way multi-junction cells should be, or that is the way multi-junction cells are made? But that, that's the point I want to uh, um, tell you is that that's not the only way to do it. In fact, uh, that many times is a very restrictive way to do it, and uh, we will discuss uh, just why. So th there are many configurations that you can use to realize this, uh, realize this uh, multiple junction cell. Uh, here's a neat idea. So you know why not use a prism which on which you shine light and it splits it uh, such that the blue light goes to this cell and uh, the green light goes to this cell and then the red light goes to this cell. Right? This is a fine idea. This should be a nice way of making it. Right? So, in fact, DARPA had a big program just to realize this. They funded a lot of research just to realize it because it allows this unrestricted uh, uh, conversion of you know in our independent operation of uh, all these uh, three cells. But the main problem over there was uh, you might think you know this is an easy way to do it, but the optics or you know the prism or the splitting system which could do that without causing a lot of loss. So usually, if you use a usual prism to split it into three, this will uh, end up absorbing more than half of the light. And the uh, main challenge in this scheme is to realizing this optical system, which uh, could be a very good uh, filter into, or which could be composed of these three filters and still not absorb or uh, not, uh, uh, not absorb a large part of your spectrum. And uh, it's an exciting field of research still if, if you guys, you know, want to uh, get into it, it's still a very valid scheme using this uh, spatial separation of these cells. 
But what is most commonly used and uh, what most of the cells which are reported on that NREL chart are made using the stacked scheme where you have uh, the highest band gap material usually stacked uh, at the top and then you have uh, the intermediate band gap material and then finally the uh, lowest band gap material and they are stacked on top of each other. But even in this, there could be multiple configuration of uh, doing so. So uh, you could essentially connect these two in series. So you have this, this configuration which I call as a two terminal where you just have this one terminal which is connecting to the higher band gap cell and then you have this another terminal which is connecting to the bottom of the lower band gap cell. Right? But you could very much have you know, this kind of a configuration where you have four terminals where uh, each of the PNN junctions of uh, your cell is connected and you know, has a power out. Or uh, you could have this three term, you could be a little more efficient and you could say that, okay, you two guys, you share the contact and you could have this uh, three terminal uh, configuration. So what I want to ask you now is, uh, you know, let's, let's collectively see what are the pros and cons of uh, realizing each. And in fact, you might know of this being uh, what is uh, currently used, but it might not be the best way to connect these things. And uh, at least I think, you know, there's a lot of potential in connecting it this way as well. So what do you think are some of the pros and cons? So, you know, many times if you work for companies, you'll find your management asking you to make these kind of charts where they say, okay, what is the pro of this technology? What are the pitfalls? And let's, you know, let's compare it then. So what do you think, um, okay, let's start here. So what is the pro of using this three or four, four terminal approach? Okay, so basically you're saying that this, uh, I could bias this individually, right? So, uh, okay. individual biasing. But I can say it's also a con because now I have to maximize the, you know, I have to find a maximum load for each of them, right? And as the spectrum changes over the course of the day, I'll have to individually go and tune, or apply individual feedback on the each of them. So I could as well as write it as a, you know, as a, as a con saying that, uh, multiple load optimization. Right. What, is, what is the pro of this design when I am uh, only have two terminals? Or what is the pitfall of this design? Okay, so one of the pitfalls is that you have to match the current, right? So your uh, uh, current densities have to be matched, right? Or current matching, okay? What else? Is there any advantage? Okay, so that's, what should I put it in? More material or less material? Less material. Well, uh, less materials as in I'll, I'll have the same material set, but now. Uh, okay, so you're bringing a good point. So I have to put an electrode in between the two terminals, right? Yeah, I mean, over here I'll have to put an electrode in between here. So what's the disadvantage of that? No, but what does the electrode cause? Like we have discussed this for crystal insulation. What if I put a top contact, what does it cause? Chaining, right? So if I, let's say, put an electrode over here, and I, let's say, I'm using the still conventional design, where I have to, pattern these lines to put these electrodes, right? 
and um, maybe even put at the bottom surface of this and at the top surface of this right so now all the cells which are below this they will see a lot of shading from these contacts right do you guys agree so uh, let me put this as a con maybe, right? Shading due to contact. Okay, you had something. So okay, so VOC is higher. But what it, what it, what what advantage does it give you? So you're saying the voltage is higher, that's correct. Uh, is Does the voltage being higher give you any power advantage? It does. But if I had these individual cells, then I, you know, I would have less voltage on each of them. Let's add this four terminal design where I had in individual cells. I would have less voltage, but I'll get, you know, individually get the maximum juice out of it, right? Rather than, so it does have some advantage, but I'm just investigating. Does anybody know? Yeah. yeah. Sure, uh, if you have higher uh, VOC, typically these cells are not uh, not connected in like a module, actually they are. Sometimes they're connected in series, and then you add up the VOC, so you'll need less of them in series, right? If does that, okay, so I don't know this, maybe you know, let me put this in yellow. But, uh, you're saying, uh, conversion with inverter is easier. Again, this is something I don't know whether it's the case or not. But one advantage that you get with higher VOC is uh, something we haven't touched upon yet, but it gives you a better temperature coefficient of efficiency. And um, we'll understand it, uh, you know, I'll, we'll understand it in the ne next spell, but you're right, I mean, it does have some advantage having higher VOC. Anything else? Anything else you can think of? Higher VOC gives higher fill factor. Why? Well, he got higher VOC by reducing the recombination. So in that case, yes, the, the higher VOC does give you a better fill factor. Because the way he was up increasing his VOC was, you know, reducing all the last mechanisms. So if you do that, you do get a uh, VOC and fill factor increase usually come together. Okay, so that that's I mean that may be right that you know you might have uh, this higher uh, parasitics associated in this case because each of these cells would be connected individually, so you might get more loss cell due to RS or you know, due to parasitics. Versus in this case, usually when electrons or when carriers flow through a cell, it's a large area available. Actually, it's not that large. These cells are quite small, as we see. But still, it's a lot of area for current to flow. So usually, resistance flowing this way should be less as compared to if I connect them in the OK. This is good, OK. Any, anything else? Actually, I still haven't touched one main con of this. Can anybody add more? So current matching is one thing, but how about you know, actually growing, I mean, actually making this cell? Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's a big, 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 you know, big, big, big uh, constraint for this. That usually, if you want to realize these in a two-terminal uh, way, you will have to either bind these materials together, which will produce a lot of traps, or you will produce a lot of uh, recombination at the surface, or you would want to grow them such so that they're lattice smashed on top of each other. And that reduces your options substantially because there are only so many materials or so many semiconductors which nature gives you which are lattice matched to each other. So this lattice matching is a big, big constraint uh, uh, on this two terminal device. Okay, so anything more you want to add? So this is good. We have pretty much covered. Uh, let me look at my list. So this is the list I had. We had no current matching, individual load matching, shading the con here um, required current matching this is a big thing lattice uh, match growth and uh, yeah so you guys are pretty good I've covered a lot of these things